exponentially and independently of GDP growth. This phenomenon is new and the consequences of this new development are disastrous to economies all over the world. According to Credit Suisse, in a report in 2015, the richest 1% of the population of the world owns 31% of all wealth, while the poorest 40% of the population of the world owns just 1% of all wealth. Approximately 61 individuals, 61 persons in the world own about 50% of the world's wealth. And most of that wealth is no longer utilized for productive investments in the economies of the world, as was the case in the past. The amassing and accumulation of wealth that is not invested in the real economy has contributed the weakening of demand and reduction of GDP growth worldwide. Where this will end, if nothing is done, no one knows. GDP growth of 5, 6, 7, even 8 percent used to be the norm. The new norm seems to be including the USA, 2 to 3 percent annual GDP growth. Inequality has increased and will continue to increase if nothing is done about it. United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean has identified this phenomenon and in its Horizon 2030 report adopted in Mexico City in May this year is urging the world to take the necessary steps to reduce inequality by the year 2030 to achieve more economic growth and to increase demand worldwide. Before wealth, financial assets were utilized to invest in goods, services, creating employment, creating circulation of money worldwide to individuals who then with that money through jobs make purchases, demand by taking, just as GDP did, money, 70 million from St. Martin and putting it in a drawer and letting it sit there, they extracted the ability for St. Martiners to buy, for money to circulate, and they reduced demand. It's no different than the phenomenon that we now recognize is taking place worldwide. Money has to be put to productive use. The wealthy today 
no longer create the infrastructure to build a table so it could be sold, to build a chair so it could be sold, to provide services. Their money goes into exotic products that produce nothing. No tables, no chairs, no buildings. It simply sits there in account, for instance, in the stock market. And it exponentially increases in size. St. Martin needs to use its classic tool, which is taxes, to accomplish redistribution. Fiscal intervention by countries could reverse the dramatic exponential increase in the accumulation of wealth by the richest 1% of the population of the world. Let me put your mind at rest. We do not have any of that 1% of the richest of the world in St. Martin. We do not have a Mr. Warren Buffett. We do not have a Mr. Bill Gates. We do not have a Carlos Slim, a George Soros, or a Larry Ellis. So any pretension that true, taxes is a tool. We are going to impact the redistribution of the wealth in the world would be mistaken. Fortunately for us, we don't have to go there. Tax reform and fiscal intervention is absolutely necessary. First of all, as far as St. Martin is concerned, Tax revenues have remained relatively flat for many years. And as we speak, we are showing signs of decline. Every year is a challenge for government to balance its budget and to provide the required services to its citizens. External threats such as global financial crisis, global warming, natural disasters which are on the increase in intensity makes it necessary to build up a resistance fund to cope with these threats. Whilst bare bone shotgun budgets leaves no room to cushion these external threats. Dominica recently experienced a flood disaster, not a hurricane, a flood that wiped out 100% of its GDP in one day. St. Martin in 1995, with Hurricane Lewis and Marlon, had the same experience. We need to be in a position to have reserves on our budget as a hedge and cushion against these eventualities. Global warming is contributing to the erosion of beaches in the Caribbean and on St. Martin. The sea level rises by 1.75 millimeters annually. Steps have to be taken to protect against this erosion. Sun, sea, and sand is the backbone of a tourist economy. That's why tourists come in droves to St. Martin. 
Without beaches, they will not come. We need to have reserves and funds in our budget to protect our beaches, to protect our economy, to protect our very way of life. Fortunately for us, no drastic fiscal steps are necessary at this time to improve revenues. Increase of tax rates is not on the table. I see many people say, <sighs> what is on the table is modernization, simplification of our tax laws, the way tax are to be filed, an improvement in our infrastructure to collect taxes efficiently and to combat tax fraud and tax evasion. As well as questions are on the table such as should we move more from direct taxes to indirect taxes or vice versa? Should we impose a value added tax in an attempt to raise more revenues? Should we maintain the turnover tax we now have in place or change it to something else? Is the turnover tax fair and burden everyone in our community, community equally? Or is the turnover tax harsher for the less fortunate and easier for the wealthy? Is it fair? In the process, thought should also be given to income redistribution and lessening of the tax burden of those who are less fortunate in our country. Tax compliance rate on St. Martin is about 22.5% of GDP. Each percentage point that we can approve on tax compliance represent with a GDP of 2 million guilders an amount of extra revenue to government of 20 million guilders. 1% in improvement in tax compliance produces 20 million guilders extra. In neighboring country, Caribbean countries, the tax compliance rate compared to GDP is about 30 percent. In OECD countries, the tax compliance rate reaches an amount of 34% of GDP. If we can boost our compliance rate from 22.5% to 26%, without raising any tax rate, it will represent 70 million guilders more income structure and we can stop living year in year out from hand to mouth in our and in your deliberations today 
you should bear in mind that we are experts in criticizing, proposing, and pontificating. But we do not perform well when it comes to execution. The task before you today is not only to criticize and to propose, but to concretely think about how to execute the thoughts and ideas that hopefully you will be sharing with each other today. This is the challenge you have before you. And I look forward to your active and enthusiastic participation in today's debate. I want to quote Iron Man. He who thinks about the future lives it. And my request to you is, let's live the future. Thank you very much. I will start off with outlining the current situation and then go into our vision for the tax administration. Most of you here are well aware that the tax administration is currently faced with a lot of challenges. Many of these challenges are as a result of a legacy inherited from the former Netherlands and Tunis. Challenges such as IT. The tax administration is currently working with several outdated systems that have been implemented in the late 1990s. New functionalities can no longer be added to these systems. So we are basically stuck in the past and we can't do anything new. The system also requires a lot of manual labor, which leads to inefficiencies. Tax returns have to be entered manually, which is time consuming and leaves room for error. Currently, much time is being spent on data entry and the correcting of administrative mistakes. This is one of the reasons why so many incorrect assessments are being levied. The current system is also not compatible with other newer systems. For example, although businesses can now file their monthly taxes online through an online portal, that information cannot be imported automatically into our current system. And therefore, this has to be done manually, which again is a waste of time and room for error. Another problem is that the levying and collecting systems are not linked. Because of this, information is not shared automatically between departments. This is inefficient and leads to delays when processing information so the taxpayer encounters a negative experience by having to go back and forth between the departments. Another problem facing the tax administration is staffing. The tax administration has been suffering from structural understaffing. At the moment, there are several critical vacancies that are not filled. This is primarily because of the lack of budget. For example, one of the vacancies that are available is for a public relations and communications person. We cannot fill this vacancy because the budget to do so is not available. Our critical vacancy list includes assessors, tax assessors, auditors, as well as collection officers. In addition to the many vacant positions, there are few workers also on pronounced sick leave, and as a result, the tax administration is running on just about half the required capacity. Half the required capacity. On top of this, the tax administration
administration is suffering from an aging workforce. The organization is in need of young, educated workers. For example, in one of our departments, the average age is 52 years old. Another problem with regard to staff is the lack of training. In order to properly be able to do their work and stay up to date with the many changes in the laws, the, tax, the, tax, the staff needs to be continually trained as untrained staff are unhappy, have lower production, work inefficient, and are more likely to make mistakes. At the moment, there is no yearly budget for staff training and not enough capacity in-house to do so. The systems and staff and staffing issues causes other problems such as backlogs in different areas of the organization. We are currently experiencing backlogs in the various tax types such as income and profit taxes, as well as backlogs in the processing of protest letters. Backlogs can lead to assessments becoming statute bar. The collection system currently does not prompt the user of assessments that are about to become statute bar. All of this results in loss of income for government, which means the government will have less money to spend. We are also facing challenges in keeping our current database up to date. For example, when people close their business, change their change address, or leave the island, and don't inform the tax administration, our database becomes polluted. If we have enough staff, a team can be put in place to go out on the road to address these situations. Another area affecting us negatively is our housing situation. The tax administration comprises of three departments, namely the inspector department, the receiver's office, and the audit and investigation department, as well as a section for support. The inspector and audit and investigation department is housed separately from the receiver's office. The reason for this is because in the past, the inspectorate As you can see from the slide, in the past, the inspectorate fell under the auspices of the Netherlands and Cities, the former Netherlands and Cities. Um, and the receiver's office fell under the, the leadership of the former island territory of St. Martin. As a result of 10 10 10, these departments have merged and now fall apart of the tax administration, of one tax administration. But unfortunately, the housing situation has remained the same due, up, due to the lack of space. Both buildings are filled to capacity and can't house everyone. Neither is, neither is there a suitable location available that can house everyone at this moment.